Welcome to week four of Sociological Theories. This week we will be uh, reading and talking about the work of Karl Marx, who is a, a genuine sociological theorist, one of what we would call the, the big three. You'll find the slide uh, in the course folder. The big three of classical sociological theorists are Durkheim, Marx, and Weber. Again, this information, this sheet, is available in the course folder or course site. Karl Marx did the vast bulk of his writing and work uh, in the mid to late 19th century. He was born in 1818. And Marx genuinely did his work. He spent years and years and years in the basement of the British Museum documenting the conditions of labor in Europe. Uh, in addition to the readings on Karl Marx and the chapter, you will find on the course site a number of links to materials about the Industrial Revolution, which was the context or provided the context for Marx's research and writing. As you review those links in the course site, questions you should be raising are to what extent the conditions of labor during the Industrial Revolution are similar to or differ from or depart from conditions of labor in the contemporary world. It's important in that context to think about not only labor in the United States, but labor in the global market. So Marx's key ideas were the idea of capitalism as emerging in the context of the Industrial Revolution, the idea of dialectical materialism or the role of class conflict in history, and I point here to a problem in Marx's thinking, and that is the problem of the inevitability of this transformation of the class system across historical periods and the inevitability of the revolution of the bourgeoisie against the proletariat under capitalism. This gives to the idea of class conflict a, a sense of or a kind of reification of the process as though the process were something external, entirely external to human volition and action. Marx, Marx's key theory is that of class conflict and note please that class for Marx is based entirely on economic position or the relationship to the means of production. Thus, for Marx, there are only two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Two other key ideas for Marx are alienation and reification. Uh, alienation and reification are covered uh, just slightly later in this brief podcast, and the ideas of ideology and false consciousness. Marx's most important works are the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, his popularization of some of his denser theor theoretical works, uh, the Communist Manifesto, published in 1848. That manifesto is available on the course site and in the Marx folder. It's a propaganda manual, and it is highly readable and very, very easy to understand. It's a call to revolution. Uh, by Marx, and I, I should say as a caveat that while I think that Marx is brilliant, there are many places where I find his work to be flawed, and one of those is the use of violence uh, to uh, overthrow uh, regimes of power. Uh, and, and that's again, that's a very complex and difficult topic, and one that many of you might want to take up, especially as we talk about polarization. And the last one is uh, Das Kapital, the densest and most difficult of his works, but also one of, of incredible significance and importance. In addition to the readings on the course site, you'll find uh, excerpts and actually the entire text of Eric Fromm's Marx's Concept of Man. This work is one from the 70s, but Eric Fromm was a brilliant writer, very, very, very eloquent. He identifies Marx's works as a protest 
against man's alienation, and here he means man in the generic sense of the term, although I would have liked to have seen a kind of interchangeability uh, of the use of the term man and women. Um, women. Uh, but what, what most concerns Eric Fromm uh, as his interpretation of Marx is the loss of self and the transformation of self and self, self and other selves into things such that, and, and you see a lot of this in, in the readings, even in your chapter readings on commodification, Eric Fromm sees or, or interprets Marx in, in light of the alienation from the process and products of labor as a consequence of industrialization. Marx's historical materialism or dialectical materialism as noted is one of his key ideas here. Materialism means something different than materialistic. Man is distinguished from other animals because he produces or she produces the means of subsistence. Man alters his or her natural history to produce his own or her own human history. Labor is the mediating factor between man and nature. The mode of production of material life conditions, social and intellectual processes. Thus, for Marx, it is not consciousness that determines social being, but rather social being that determines consciousness. This is a very, very interesting and key idea, especially in the early Marx, uh, and one that uh, captures the attention of many uh, sociologists and undergraduates, graduate students. In the problem of consciousness and false consciousness, Eric Fromm reaches his true genius, and especially as he points out the distinction between Marx and Freud. For Freud, false consciousness is rooted in hidden libidinal strivings that are unconscious to him or her. For Marx, these are rooted in the social organization which directs consciousness and blocks awareness. So for Freud, this false consciousness takes place on the individual psycho psychological or psychoanalytic level. For Freud, this is a social organization or a manifestation of social organization. Consciousness is a social product and here we quote from Ludwig Feuerbach, Religion is the dream of the human mind, but even in dreams we do not find ourselves in the emptiness or in heaven, but on earth, in the realm of reality. We see only things in the entrancing splendor of imagination and caprice, but instead of in the simple daylight of reality and necessity. Ludwig Furbach and Marx's interpretation of religion, not one with which everybody agrees or must agree, but definitely an intrinsic feature of Marx and his understanding of false consciousness. Again, this is more, borrows more from the Fromm interpretation of Marx, but for Marx, there's a, a, a nature of man or humans he has many insights, some of which are very romantic, but a key in Marx is distinction between having something and being. For Marx, the privatization of property makes us stupid. It is The object is ours when we have it, when it is utilized. For Marx, science the science of capitalistic economy is a truly moral science. It is in the renunciation of life and human needs that individuals save and acquire capital. So the less you are, that is the less you be, or you are a being, the more you save and the more capital you have. And according to Marx, the more you have and save, the greater your alienation. Life 
and humanity are, in a sense, restored, but really transmuted into the acquisition of money and things. We'll see there, we'll revisit this uh, with the work of uh, Weber. So, alienation, and this is really alienation and the interpretation from from alienation or estrangement means that man does not have an experience of himself as an active agent. This is a concept that was first found expression in the Old Testament, concept of idolatry. Idols are the work of human hands. We create them and project power onto them and then worship them. Instead of experiencing ourselves as the creative agency behind these objects, so the idols are dead and empty. For Marx, the process of alienation is embedded in work and the division of labor. This results in alienation from both the process and the products of labor. Key here is not inequality, but enslavement by things of one's own creation. Again, a lot of this is coming from Feuerbach, uh, from whom Marx borrowed this idea. And here, behind this, behind this whole idea of embedding products or, or material objects with properties that are properly belong to human beings is part of the process of reification that is giving them a, a life of their own. Alienation in your textbook uh, is outlined in, in four types from products, from the production process, from species being, and from each other. And so now looking at the Communist Manifesto, which is also available on the course site, Marx's simplest most eloquent expression. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Freeman, slave, patrician, and plebeian, lord and serve, guild, master, and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Well, this is very eloquent, but the question is, is it true? And is it true, was it true only during the Industrial Revolution, or is it true in a more generic sense? So, uh, I'll see you this week in class. <laughs>